Hi there, it's uh, Craig here again. I guess this is going to be part two of my conversation about what is sound. Uh, this is the whole, um, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it still make a sound? Now, this is part two. If you want to see part one, I'll have a, a link on the screen that you can click on and go and watch part one. And at the end of part one, I'll link you back to this part, part two. So my answer to that question, is there, if a tree falls and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? My answer is no, it doesn't make a sound. It causes the vibrations that cause sound, but sound is observer dependent. Meaning that sound happens as a result of a sensation that we get from the vibration of the medium, in this case air. Okay? So without an observer, that be it a human, an animal, or whatever, without something to, to uh, perceive that vibration, then it's just a vibration. It doesn't have anything to do with sound until it becomes a sensation of sound in your body. Okay, it's, it's observer dependent. Now, here's an example. Um, you're on the moon. Okay, and you've got your, you know, your your gear on, your EVA suit. You're walking on the moon, and you can hear inside of your helmet. You can hear the radio and other people talking on their radio. You can hear the noises that you make as as you move around inside your your helmet. But because you're you know you're, you're it's completely sealed unit and there's air inside there, you can you can hear inside there. Okay, but if you take and throw a rock on the surface of the moon, you are not going to hear it because there's no air on the moon. Uh, so there's no medium to transmit the vibrations that would then become sound when perceived by the observer. Okay, so it's safe to say there's no sound on the moon. Well, I'll tell you what you could do to change that because now it's observer dependent. If you can put the observer in a situation where he could then hear sound on the moon, then all of a sudden there's sound on the moon. It's observer dependent. So you lay down on the surface of the moon and you put your helmet on the ground of the moon, on the floor of the moon, and you hit the ground. You will then hear yourself hitting the moon because the, the vibration of your hand hitting the ground will transmit through your helmet into the air inside your helmet and now there's sound on the moon. It's observer dependent. If the observer can perceive the vibrations, then there's sound. If the observer, if the observer can't perceive the vibrations, there's no sound. There's still vibrations. There's no sound. You threw that rock it landed, you heard nothing. It vibrated the surface of the moon, there was vibrations, but you were not able to detect those because the medium was not transmitting to you. So there was a vibration, there was just no sound. There was no sound until you put your head against the ground, tapped on the ground, and then there was sound because you could then hear it. Is there sound on the moon? Is there not sound on the moon? Now, now it's a question of of the observer and what uh, what situation he or she is in. So it's observer dependent. So sound is, is a vibration of the air as perceived by an observer. You have to have an observer there. Without the observer, the sound part is not present. The vibration part is there. You've got half the picture. But until it's perceived, it's not a sound. It's just a vibration. Now, if that isn't enough for you, let's move on to my next topic that I want to cover, which I thought by now I would have done this, but the sound thing seems to be hanging some people up. There's a lot of definitions on the internet about, uh, of sound. Some of them I feel are very inaccurate. I have read some ones that I felt were accurate that basically referred to there being an observer um, so the vibrations of a medium, you know, as, as perceived by an observer, um, whether it be a human or animal or whatever, 
okay? And then you've got sound. I like those definitions. Those are the ones that I base my thing on. I don't know whether it was who wrote it or what the De Webster or whoever it was. I don't agree with some of the definitions that I've read out there. And I, I think a revision is in, is, in, is, in, is in question there. I think it needs to be revised. Uh, however, let's talk about something else, one of our, another one of our senses. And maybe this will bring this more into focus because it's exactly the same scenario. Okay, we have the sense of smell. Now, what is smell? Okay, so what is sound? What is smell? Exactly the same question, just about a different sensation. Okay, so what causes smell? Well, let's see, what have we got here? We've got atoms. Atoms form molecules. Molecules have all different shapes and sizes and configurations. And that's what determines what we're going to sense when the molecules uh, plug into our, our, our smell receptors. So when you smell something, what you're doing is you're perceiving your, your, it, the smell is your perception of a specific type of molecule or a mixture thereof. Okay, so let's say you've got a sewer. Sewers generally produce methane, okay? It's that rotten egg smell you smell when you walk past a sewer. Okay, if you aren't there to smell it, and if nobody is perceiving this smell, quote-unquote, then is there really a smell? Okay, well, what have we got? Let's go back. We've got atoms. Okay, they don't smell. They're all the I mean, they're basically all the same. Electrons, protons, and neutrons, different amounts. Atoms form molecules. So you've got the methane molecule, which is a carbon atom and four uh, hydrogen atoms, bound to, you know, bound. So you've got this atom, you've got this, this um, molecule configuration. Okay, and, but all of this is a molecule. It doesn't have anything to do with smell. It doesn't know about smell. It's just a bunch of atoms stuck together. Where's the smell in that? The smell doesn't happen until that molecule plugs into your smell receptor unit in your, in your, in your, uh, behind your nose. And by it doing so, produces a sensation in your body, in your brain, that the sensation is the smell. And it's, I guess it's the same argument. If there's nobody there to smell it, then it's not a smell, it's just a molecule. It's just a molecule. It, that's all it is. There's nothing about that molecule that would give it a smell other than the way that your body responds to it when it hits it. And that's that. Again, it's observer dependent. This is the sensation that we're going to produce based on these molecules that have come in here. There's nothing about them without an observer. There's nothing about them that has anything to do with smell. Smell is a, is a, is a you know, a biological response to a specific type of, of matter, of molecule. And I don't think that's arguable. But, again, it's the same premise. It's the same, you know, are we inside the box? Are we outside the box? I mean, what is it, you know? Without the observer, what is there? There's just stuff. So that, you know, so that's smell. And taste is basically the same. I mean, it's, it's, it's similar. Your tongue has... Uh, different regions on it. They're sensitive to different t molecule types, but most of what you're tasting is actually your, your, the uh, odor of the food going up into your smell center, um, and you're smelling it mo actually a lot more than you're tasting it. So taste is, is just a sort of enhanced way of smelling things. Um, it's a different type of sensation. Things generally do taste similar to how they smell, um, but they've got the added organ of the tongue involved there that does add a different type of smell sensation we call taste. And again, taste is just uh, our body's response to specific types of molecules. The only other one I haven't really touched on is, uh, is sight, of course. Now, that's a complicated one. I'm not sure I want to get into that during this video too much. But um, basically, we, we see because light bounces off of things. Light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we perceive.
We cannot perceive any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum other than this little small portion. We call this light. Okay? There's a whole other part to the electromagnetic spectrum that our senses are not capable of detecting. And without external equipment that we've invented, we would never know it existed. Okay? So again, we're observing a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the rest of it gets basically left out. We have had basically no idea it existed until, you know, 100 years ago. Or whatever, 200 years ago. Whatever it was. Uh, when we started playing around with things. So, are our eyes deceiving us? Because we don't actually see objects. We only see light. Without light, we can't see anything. Um, so, we're seeing the light bouncing off the objects. And we're not seeing it as it's traveling through space. We're only seeing it as it's, as it's bouncing off of an object. So you don't see it when it's coming from the light to the object. But as soon as it hits the object and ricochets off, that's the instant that you're seeing the light. Then, of course, then it travels to your eye and you don't see that part of it. Otherwise, you'd see haze all over the place. If you have a cordless phone, an old 800 megahertz cordless phone, you've probably noticed that you can walk halfway down the street and the thing still works. You can be four doors down in somebody's house and the thing still works. It goes through all those walls and into the base unit in your home and it still, it still works. But as you get up into 2.4 gigahertz and now the, I, think it's, I think they've got a 5 gigahertz one, You'll notice that this, this is um, less, uh, less the case because at, at higher frequencies, electromagnetism has a harder time penetrating uh, matter. So at the 800 megahertz range, the electromagnetism go through walls and everything else. But at the 2.4 gigahertz, which is 2,400 megahertz, I believe, yes, and at the 5,000 megahertz or 5 gigahertz range, this is no longer very easy for electromagnetism to do. It no longer has a very easy time passing through walls. That's why the older phones have a longer, longer reception. Okay? So, at lower frequencies, electromagnetism passes through things. At the frequency where we see electromagnetism does not have a very easy time passing through things. In fact, it bounces off most objects. Glass, water, other things like that, it can pass through. Um, but when it comes to most solid objects around us, it bounces off and that's how we see. But what if, what if our eyes operated at those lower frequencies we talked about? What if our eyes operated at 800 megahertz instead of the Geez, I don't even know the frequency that light operates at. I'll have to look that up. I'll post it at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> what if our eyes did operate at the lower frequencies? Then we would, be, we would be able to see through things. The world would look completely different to us. If we saw at the same frequency that a cordless phone operates in the electromagnetic spectrum, we would be able to see through almost everything. In fact, most objects would look like just transparent like sort of like glass without the shine and that's how the world would look so the world only looks the way it does because of the electromagnetic part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes operate at but at the lower frequencies at the lower end of that spectrum if that's where we saw if that's where our eyes operated then we'd be living in glass houses. We'd have to build everything out of, out of metal in order for not to be able to see through stuff. Because um, electromagnetism doesn't travel through metal at any frequency very easily. Do you get what I'm saying? It's The way we see the world is really just dependent on, on, on how our eyes work. And if, to go further with this, you take something like um, a bee who sees far beyond the... Uh, spectrum that we see, bees can see ultraviolet light as well as regular old light. So a flower that looks yellow to you 
might look have wild designs on it to a bee. And that's because a bee needs to see that so it can pollinate and know which flower to go to and so forth. Uh, we don't need to see that. We don't pollinate. So it's not important for us to see those ultraviolet frequencies. And if we could see them, the world would look very different to us than it does now. It's all dependent on how we, how we perceive it. All that's out there is stuff. Matter, molecules, atoms, electromagnetic energy. It's just all stuff. You know? And it's our perception of it. It's our... It's us, us being able to sense it. It's our perception of it that causes the sensations that we call sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. Those things exist um, only because we perceive them as such. Yes, there's electromagnetism. Without an observer, there's electromagnetism. Yes, without an observer, there's vibrations. Yes, without an observer, there's molecules of different types floating around. But as soon as you bring the observer into the picture, those things are transformed into the things that we know of as hearing uh, or sound, uh, smell, and, and sight. And it's interesting to think about what it would be like if our eyes operated at a lower, a much lower frequency in the spectrum. How things would look. They'd look radically different than they do now. Perception. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting how we see the world, how we sense the world. And it's, it's just, it's, it's a manifestation of sensations to us. And there's really no way of knowing what things are really like. Because in order, to, in order to detect something or to study it, there has to be some sort of a measuring uh, apparatus or a, detect a detecting apparatus. And that very act of measuring or detecting is going to have some influence on how that phenomenon is being, is being observed, is being perceived. Yeah, I think I've just confused myself there. Anyway, that's the end of this talk. I'm looking forward to the conversations that come forth uh, due to this. And thank you very much for watching. Um, and have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.